Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, thanks, Kirby. Uh, this is Mike Luisi. I am the new board chair for uh, the Tautog Management Board, and I would like to call this meeting of the Tautog Management Board to order. Today is January 25th, 2022. Uh, before I get started, I would like to recognize the service of Bill Hyatt, uh, the former Tautog Board Chair, and thank Bill for his time spent um chairing this board uh you know I, I was looking back through the proceedings from the previous meeting and realized that that bill made a comment early on that he was able to uh be board chair for for tatog for uh two years without ever having to do anything in person and uh while i hope to follow in bill's footsteps uh in the leadership role on this board uh, I really hope that uh, that's not going to be the case for me and for all of us. Uh, hopefully, we'll all be able to see each other sometime soon as we clear through the uh, the pandemic that we've been dealing with for the last two years. So thanks again, Bill. And um, OK, with that said, I'd like to move to the first item on our agenda, which is the approval of the agenda. There is one item to note here. Uh, originally, when the uh, meeting agenda came out, there were six items on today's agenda, and then we had a supplemental materials come out with a revision to that to the today's agenda. So I would like to make sure everybody is um, using and working from the current agenda, which has six items. Um, we what we did was we removed the election of vice chair from the original agenda. So. With the agenda before you uh, with six items, are, are there any members of the board that would like to make any additions or modifications to that agenda? If you could raise your hand. Okay, seeing no hands raised, uh, the agenda is approved. And moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is the approval of the proceedings of the minutes from the October 2021 meeting. Uh, are there any Board members that have any additions or modifications to the proceedings from the 20 uh, October board meeting. Okay, seeing nothing at this time. Uh, are there any objections to approving the proceedings in minutes from the October 2021 meeting? Okay, seeing no hands, uh, that is approved uh, with no objection. And moving on to our third item on today's agenda, we're uh, here for public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to offer comment on anything not on today's agenda. Is there anyone from the public that would like to provide public comment today? And if, you, if you're a member of the public and you don't have the ability to raise your hand uh, through your device, if you're just on the phone, just please speak up and recognize yourself before you begin. Okay, I have Tim O'Brien. Go ahead, Tim. And Tim, you need to unmute yourself. In order to unmute yourself, you wanna click on the microphone button that is in the Go to webinar toolbar. It looks like a microphone and yep, it turns green. Perfect. There you go. You just remuted yourself, Tim. There you go. All right. How are you guys? Great. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks, Tim. Can you um, just tell us your name for the record and um, who you're affiliated with? Yes, my name is Tim O'Brien, um, New York fisherman. Um, I just wanted to comment on the tags and uh, see where if we're going anywhere with this. I just uh, I posted a comment. Um, you know what we're seeing is uh, a problem with the tags infecting the fish and harming the fish. So I was wondering if Tim, Tim yeah. if I could if I could just if I could stop you here for just a second. So the law enforcement committee is going to provide some discussion on the commercial tagging program uh, towards the end of today's meeting. So would it, since it, since you're talking about the tags, uh, would it? I think it might be best if we just hold off on your comment until then. Okay. Would that be okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, I'll ask for public comment on that agenda item later on in today's uh, meeting, and then 
please just like you did raise your hand and I'll go ahead and call on you and you can give us your thoughts. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public? Okay, seeing none at this time, let's go ahead. I'd like to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is a review and discussion on the hypothetical scenarios from the risk and uncertainty decision tool. We have Jason McNamee with us to provide that presentation. So I'm gonna turn uh, the floor over to Jason. If, if you're ready, Jason, uh, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm ready to go. Uh, Maya, I think you're gonna control the um, presentation for me, so thank you for that. And I see it up on the screen there. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, this is a quick presentation, just kind of updating you. Uh, if you recall the last board meeting, <clears throat> you had asked, since we weren't taking any management action on TATOG, but we had sort of initiated testing out our risk and uncertainty tool onto TOG, we, um, we did some hypothetical scenarios. So we're just reporting out on that. Next slide, please, Maya. So uh, just quick background. I, I think you, you all are um, fully up to speed on this at this point, but just to get everybody's head uh, back in the space of risk and uncertainty, uh, the draft risk and uncertainty policy and decision tool, and what it does is it provides a method for arriving at the appropriate risk tolerance level for a stock, given management priorities and the characteristics of that species and that fishery. So uh, the tool kind of creates this uh, risk tolerance level. We can then use that to select harvest levels based on things like uh, projections. An important um, nuance here is it's not a tool for assessing the varying, varying risk levels of different management approaches. That's a different uh, thing that hopefully we start doing more frequently. Uh, but that would be a management strategy evaluation where you're kind of comparing two different uh, management strategies and seeing how they stack up across different metrics. Uh, that's not what this is. This is a little bit different where we're just um, trying to um, set an objective way for determining the board's risk tolerance for any particular um, management uh, decision that needs to be made so that we don't have to iterate uh, back and forth with the technical groups to decide that. Next slide. This is a schematic of um, what kind of happens in the process. So you have your technical inputs over in the left-hand box there. Um, they go all the way from sort of your standard stuff like stock status, model uncertainty, um, all the way down to uh, socioeconomic considerations are built into it as well. So those are your technical inputs, they get plugged in. Then you have the second component, which are the weightings. And this is where the management board decides how important all of those different technical inputs are um, in the construction of that final um, risk tolerance level. So you plug all that stuff in, you turn the crank, uh, and out of the tool comes a risk tolerance level. Um, we're gonna start talking about that risk tolerance level in terms of it being a goal probability of achieving the reference point. Um, so, you know, just to kind of characterize that a little bit better, what we are, Putting forward is this is our goal. You know, it's not um, anything other than what we um, hope will occur. And so, um, hopefully, that that type of terminology um, helps a little bit in, in how we're talking about this. Um, and in the end, that probability that comes out of the tool will be used uh, with projections to identify a harvest level, and then that will allow us to move on with our uh, process. Uh, next slide. So um, we selected TATOG as a pilot case uh, to test out the policy and the tool. Um, the technical committee for TATOG and the committee for uh, economics and social science uh, provided technical inputs for us. Uh, we then got the board together. If, if you recall, we did the kind of online surveying uh, to provide those 
uh, inputs on the weightings, and then we combine those to develop the four regional TATOG risk and uncertainty decision tools. So uh, back uh, last year in the fall, uh, the board reviewed the preliminary decision tools. So we um, kind of did a little presentation like this showing you the outcome. Um, at the time, uh, we were also um, in the process of going through a stock assessment and determining whether or not we needed to take any management action. Um, luckily for TATOG, we did not. Um, that is good for TATOG, bad for testing the decision tool, um, but it was good news, but we didn't have to take any management action. And so what we decided to do instead was to um, put together some hypothetical scenarios so that we could see what would have happened had we uh, needed to do anything. Next slide. So that kind of gets us uh, back up to speed um, as to where we are today. This is another schematic of the risk and uncertainty process. So you've got your technical components that go into the decision tool. Um, so th this is kind of an iterative process and I don't know that this was necessarily clear um, from the outset here. So there's kind of an iteration here where you plug the technical components in and you produce a goal probability, but you do this without the socioeconomic considerations. And you use that to set some preliminary harvest levels. You look at the differences between those preliminary levels and your status quo, and then you can pull in those socioeconomic components because now the um, folks on the um, on the CES, they understand what we're talking about, what the uh, impact might be and so that allows them to do their part um, in populating the decision tool so then they plug in uh, their information and, and off we go uh, so next slide maya so again those all of those next steps are triggered by initiation of a management action which we didn't have here so next slide what we're doing instead is kind of jumping over those and, and creating a make-believe world and, and setting up some hypothetical scenarios. Um, and so what we did, the two um, the highest level scenarios that we looked at were, um, what if there was no difference in the harvest level or what if we needed about a five to 10% um, change in harvest and it could have been up or down. Uh, next slide. So just a little tangent here, I, I know that I often have to sort of pause and think uh, about this kind of um, very, in a very focused manner because it's, it, it can get confusing. Um, and so we thought we'd take you on a little tangent here to talk about the probabilities of when we're talking about, um, you know, an F rate with a 60% probability or an F rate with a 50% probability, what exactly does that mean? Uh, and hopefully these next three slides help to, um, you know, give you a little more information on that. So uh, when we do a stock assessment, we often uh, use projections um, to set up our uh, management metrics. And so um, these projections take into account uncertainty. So basically, you know, it's a thousand runs is sort of a standard number of of projections to run, it could be more, it could be less, um, but you conduct about a thousand runs with different uh, parameter configurations, uh, so different starting abundances uh, within the uncertainty that the, the assessment thinks there might be around that. So um, you, you know, it goes through and it picks a, a slightly different abundance, starting abundance, slightly different recruitment amount. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of goes through resamples of those two things and produces basically a new uh, reality. And you do that a thousand times. And so you get this um, kind of uh, haze of reality. So on the plot you're looking at, uh, on the screen there, you have your total F on the uh, Y axis and then time along the X axis. The darker colors are the center of the distribution. And so those represent the darker the blue is, uh, that is your expected outcome. And as that blue color gets lighter, 
those are less likely, but within the realm of probability um, outcomes, given the uncertainty in the stock assessment. Next slide. So when we uh, talk about the probability that we're trying to meet, what's better, higher or lower? So of course, uh, we shouldn't characterize it as being better or worse, um, but in the way we can characterize it is that in the case of F, or fishing mortality, the higher the probability you set, the more conservative your management will be. So um, often we talk about a 50% probability, and what you can see here is it's not a coin flip that uh, folks often like to sort of characterize it as. It's, it's more that you're taking all of those um, projections and those different possibilities and outcome, and you're splitting it in half, and you're picking the middle of that distribution, the center of that dark blue, and you can kind of see the dark black line right in the center there. Uh, that is what you're picking. And so you're basically setting it at the most likely outcome or the center of the, the distribution. Next slide. If you were to do something a little different and say bump that up to a 60% probability, what you're doing is you're setting that uh, fishing mortality rate at a level that makes the projection distribution asymmetrical. And so 60% of your realizations will be below the F target and 40% will be above it. And what you're trying to do is give yourself more chances of being um, at the F target that you've selected. Um, there's a 60% chance rather than um, just a 50% chance. So hopefully that was helpful um, context for you. Again, it was just a little tangent um, so that the rest of the presentation um, makes sense. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. So using the technical inputs from the technical committee and the weightings from the board, um, the decision tools can produce regional goal probabilities without those socioeconomic uh, considerations. So this includes everything except those socioeconomic components. I um, mean, you can see there's a list there in that first sub bullet. And so what you come out with in the case of TATOG are the following uh, probabilities. So for the Massachusetts Rhode Island region, uh, without the socioeconomic considerations, you'd want to select a 54% uh, probability of, um, since we're talking about F, I'll keep talking about that. Um, so uh, a 54% probability of being at your F target. Long Island sounds a little bit more than that at 59%. New Jersey, New York bite is 61%. So that's the highest one. And then Delmarva uh, drops it back down to about 56%. One important note is that Amendment 1 uh, stipulates that you, know, you need to have a minimum of a 50%, um, you need to be at a minimum of 50% of uh, the F target. So um, that kind of sets some sideboards up in the case of, of TATOG. So even if the decision tool were to produce a, um, a probability that was less than 50%, so more uh, risky, less conservative, you would get kind of um, set back at 50%. So basically you couldn't go below that per the FMP. So that it's an important consideration in the case of TATOG. Um, I don't know how unique that is for that to be stipulated in the different management plans, but it is explicit in the TATOG FMP. Next slide. So hypothetical scenarios, um, we looked at uh, a couple of different um, things here. So you've got the hypothetical differences between the preliminary harvest level and a status quo harvest level. So there's two potential um, you know, hypothetical situations there. One is to have no difference and one is to have about a five to 10% difference. So that's what we looked at with regard to the harvest levels. 
And then we also looked at uh, some alternate uh, alternative weightings for the socioeconomic components. Um, and so we, we looked at some differences here to kind of show you what the tool does given these different circumstances so you can kind of see in real time you know how much does it go up how much does it go down given different um, weightings uh, just a sort of interesting fact and this is something that john clark brought up a couple of times as we've been discussing this um, the way that the board ended up setting the weightings for the short term and long term socioeconomic components they basically canceled each other out um, so there was kind of a split between those who valued short-term over long-term um, considerations, and uh, there was a pretty an equal split, and so um, they ended up canceling e each other out. So to kind of, again, test the bounds of the tool, we uh, tinkered with those a little bit as well. So we'll look at one given the current weighting that we produced, and then we also um, tweak those a little bit to put um, the short term, uh, a lot of the weight on the short term versus the long term. And then we put a really extreme weight on the short term versus the long term and then vice versa. Hopefully uh, that made sense and um, will uh, kind of translate now into the next slide, uh, Maya. And this is the outcome of all of that. So to orient you to the table here, um, let's start with the left-hand column. These are your scenarios, and I'll kind of um, walk through uh, those. And then the next column over, these are your socioeconomic weightings. So these are the weighting factors that go into the model. Um, and you have commercial and recreational, and each of those has a short-term ST or long-term LT um, component to it. And uh, in the right hand column, those that's the outcome, that's your answer. So this, if the any of these scenarios um, were real, these would be the probabilities that we would be telling uh, the technical committee to use um, when giving us back the effort that we need uh, to meet for our um, management uh, changes. So the scenario one, that's no change to the harvest level. So these are uh, the same as what I showed you in that uh, table on, on the, uh, I'm not sure if it was the last slide or two slides ago. So that's um, the existing, uh, or that's without any of the socioeconomic weightings. Then we get into our different scenarios. <clears throat> so that's scenario two. That's as, as if we had a five to 10% change to the harvest level. So 2A is if we kept the weightings, how we had configured them as a board. Um, and you can see that uh, they sort of offset each other uh, there because they're of equal value. And so that those goal probabilities look exactly the same as the row up above it. To go on to 2B, this is the a scenario where we said the short-term considerations are more important uh, than the long-term, but at a moderate level, so the scoring is um, not that extreme. And what you can see there is that those initial probabilities all decrease um, to varying degrees. So for the Mass Rhode Island region, they went from 54% down to 52%. So this is that push and pull of the decision tool where you're um, weighting those socioeconomic factors in the short term higher. And in this case, what that did was um, it decreased the probability, meaning it would um, allow you a less conservative uh, management option. Moving on to 2C, uh, this is short-term uh, considerations with an extra high weighting. So we bumped that score up to 10 and kept the long-term uh, the same as it was. And um, in a sort of logical manner, it drives those probabilities down even further. Um, and so you can see that it goes from 54 down to 50% for the Mass Rhode Island region. 
Um, just another example, New Jersey, New York bike goes from 61% down to 57%. So um, the short term considerations are really pulling that and allowing you to be uh, less conservative with your management. And then uh, 2D and 2E is just the reciprocal of those. So here we've got short term being um, weighted less than the long term. And then 2D is with long term at a moderate level. So you can see the probabilities all go up from that initial value from 54% up to 56% for Mass Rhode Island, 61% up to 63% uh, for New Jersey, New York bite. And then when you make that super extreme, uh, it goes up uh, a little bit more. And you can see that in that bottom row. So uh, we'll come back to this table so you can um, process that a little more, but just to kind of wrap up uh, the presentation so that we can get to your questions. Um, next slide, uh, Maya, I think should be the last one. So um, any questions? And as we get on to the questions here, just a final thought on, um, you know, what, thanks Jay, but now what? Uh, we think, you know, the idea here is to get any feedback from the TATOG board on this test run of the tool. Um, we'll kind of collate your feedback and then report those findings back to the policy board. Um, so that's kind of the next steps for this process. So with that, Mr. Chair, happy to take any questions. And Maya, um, it might be most helpful to flip back to the um, that last slide we were on with the table. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm glad you captured uh, at the end there kind of what the, what you're looking for and as far as direction from the board. Uh, but before we get to that, let's see if anyone has any clarifying questions for Jason. Okay, Chris Wright. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, Jason. Um, if uh, a stock is, um, you know, overfished or overfishing, how would that get incorporated into that timeline in the feedback? You know, when would you consider that in your in that chart that we had in the beginning in the timeline? Yep. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the question. So um, that, in particular, that aspect, uh, it, it's actually built into the decision tool, um, and so stock status is one of those technical inputs um, that are at the kind of the higher end of, of the decision tool there. So. Um, you know, in the case where if stock status were bad, those would uh, add um, precaution into the system. And so the, um, you know, those like we're looking at the table here on the screen, those, uh, those probabilities would be, you know, higher than that if, if stock status were bad. And um, each component of stock status gets treated um, as a, an independent uh, factor in the decision tool. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, John Clark, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for another uh, very interesting presentation on this, Jay. Uh, just glad you have the uh, chart up there. It looks like even under the most extreme uh, weightings that the probability only changes about 4%. Is that pretty typical that these weightings are not meant to really affect the, the probability too much, Jay? Yeah, good question, John. So I, I think uh, you're exactly right. So a, a couple of a couple of answers, you know, what we wanted to illustrate here for you is um, that you don't get wild swings um, in the proportions um, like you don't you know go all the way up to 100 percent just by some small modifications in the tool so that was part of the the reasoning here for the scenarios that were um, selected but in the end i think your uh your comment is correct so by building this into that logistic function um you know, into the logistic function, that, that is what exactly what that does is it kind of, um, you know, tapers 
the effect of things as you get out towards the tails and it slows them down. Um, and the reason for that, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is so that you don't get wild fluctuations. Um, and the other is so you can kind of fit in different um, components that might have different scales associated with them. Um, and so, you know, that's why we chose the, the logistic functional form for the tool. Um, but that is uh, what you said is correct. So kind of a long winded uh, way to say yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jay. Um, go high. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, John just asked the same question I was going to ask. I was seeing a, a six to eight uh, percent swing in the probabilities between the most extreme scenarios, and I just wanted to see if I wanted to know if they had a, a gut feel for that to be the expected. And I think that's just been answered. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Bill. Any other questions uh, by the from the board at this time? Okay, I don't see any hands raised for questions. Any comments? Jay, I wonder if you could go back to the statement that you made at the conclusion of your presentation and just kind of frame out what it is you might be looking for regarding comment. Uh, or direction from the board here, uh, so that everybody's yeah. kind of everyone's clear, and then we can we can seek to uh, obtain that from the board members. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chair. That I think that will help. Um, and I'll kind of lead off here. And, and if uh, Sarah, if you're out there on radio land and, and you want to add in, please do. Um, but you know, the idea here is we've gone through the. Um, We've gone through TATOG with the, the risk and uncertainty tool from beginning to end. And so feedback from the board, you know, did you love it? Did you hate it? Do you think there are things that need to be fixed or investigated further? Um, or do you think this is ready to be tested on uh, another species? Um, anything in that type of comment uh, range would be really valuable for us to then go back to the policy board and, and start to think about, um, you know, do we want to test it on another species first? Are we ready to start building this in? And what's the sequence we want to, to build, uh, build it out with that sort of thing? So Sarah, I don't know if there's anything uh, in addition that you, you think we should uh, request from the board. Um, no, I think you covered everything. That's that's really it. Any feedback and and thoughts on parts you uh, thought were challenging, or if you thought it worked well, anything on uh, thoughts on next steps or comfort level, anything in that vein would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's see what uh, what the board would like to offer here. Um, start with Dan McKiernan. Good, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have kind of a general question about, and I, and I really like the approach and it's really fascinating, but would this work for a Magnuson species? Does, does Magnuson with all of its, uh, you know, priorities and guidelines, does it get too muddled? And is, so my question is, is this only appropriate for ASMFC species that doesn't have to deal with the, all the nuances of Magnuson? Yeah, that's a really good question, Dan. Um, I'll turn to staff first. Maybe that conversation's come up. Uh, yes. Or if there's anyone from the service on the line that may be able to speak to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in again, Mr. Chair, if that's all right. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, we have discussed this, and the intention is, is for this to be applied to commission-managed uh, only species so that uh, there's no conflict there as the councils for example have their own risk policies and and that would uh present a challenge to have conflicting risk policies so the intention is to use this for uh species that that the commission manages solely
Mike, if you're talking to us, you're muted. Oh boy, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, let me think about what I said <laughs> while I was going on and on. Um, I appreciate yeah, I appreciate the the answer to that question, and I guess it's time now to um, really consider what we want to do with this tool. Um, as as Jay as Jay mentioned, you know there we didn't have an opportunity with uh, Tautog to use the tool because we decided not to make any management adjustments based on the most recent assessment. But it doesn't mean the tool couldn't be used else somewhere else. And I uh, there was a mention of perhaps taking this to the policy board to see if the policy board would like to consider. Um, other species for this tool to be uh, to, to be used with. So with that idea in mind, uh, let me see what you what you all think. I'll go to Bill Hyatt. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just have, have maybe another question for for Jay. Um, in considering this tool, in, in, in the opinion of the people that have worked on it, is it better to gather a lot of the information in advance? of needing to actually apply it to management decisions or do you perceive gathering the information sort of in the heat of the decision making process how how do you, how does this type of tool how do you envision it kind of rolling out into a, um something that can be can be applied yeah that's an awesome question bill um and it's you know i think there are um I think it's the former uh, of, of what you said. And, and what I mean by that is, I think you wanna get these constructed and not try and do that necessarily in the, the heat of the moment. Um, some of them you have to wait for, you know, stock assessment information, they depend, you know, some of the components depend on that. So some of that has to wait, but there's no reason why a board couldn't get together um, and kind of set up their weightings for the socioeconomic components. Uh, and, and so the weighting part of it, that could be done ahead of time. And in fact, would would be best to do that ahead of time when you can sort of think clearly uh, and objectively about it. Um, but remember, this was always meant to be kind of an iterative process. So even though you set those weightings up ahead of time, there's always this opportunity to kind of revisit, um, and I'll, I'll give you a, a scenario. So say you, um, you set your um, decision tool up for species X, and then you go through uh, an assessment process and the outcome is really bad for species X, and it's going to result in some really significant um, reductions that's going to really hurt, let's say, uh, particular community. And so during that, even though you've already set your weightings, um, the folks that interact with that community might come forward and say, hey, look, here's our reasoning for upweighting the short-term consequences uh, this time. And it, the point is that you're being explicit as to why you're changing the weighting. So that gets recorded and then you can uh, reproduce with that new weighting if the rest of the the board, um, you know, concurs with you. So that's kind of the idea there. I think it is best to create it ahead of time and then um, sort of tweak while you're in the process. That's kind of the idea. Okay, thanks, Jay. Uh, John Clark, you're next. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this is a great idea to bring to the policy board and uh, try with other species. I know on uh, during several addendum amendment processes, uh, I've talked about it, many others have talked about taking into account the long-term and short-term effects on the economies involved. And this is a small concrete step toward taking those into account when we uh, move to actually uh, change our compliance requirements during the addendum and amendment process. So I would like to see this move forward. I think it's really, really good. Thanks. 
Hey, okay, Mike. thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Just to clarify, I think what we're trying to get feedback from this board in terms of what we would discuss at the policy board level is that th this board was a test case for using the policy. Um, we worked a little bit with it in Stripe Bass at the very beginning, and then we moved it to to this to talk board since it was going through the assessment process. And so when we bring it back to the policy board, I think it would be great to have feedback to them to see if you think it should be tested on other species as well, or are we at a level that you're comfortable enough to make this a policy that the commission uses for all of its um, commission managed species. Um, so I, I just wanna make sure that there is this like kind of clear distinction um, that we'll be asking the question of the policy board. Are you ready to accept this as your risk policy or are you going to be testing it on additional species? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for that clarification, Tony. Uh, I'll I, I'm sorry I'm... to talk back in again, but yeah, I just I was call you know, back I kind of mentioned, Tony, Tony that uh, and I, I would like to see it tested on other species, but I do think it should be made a policy. So kind of both. Do you have a preference, John, which you'd prefer to happen first? Well, I think it would give everybody more kind of um, um, acceptance and um, uh, belief in it if it was tested one uh, on one more species maybe before we take it live for everything. Thanks. Okay, that's a good point, John. Appreciate that. Uh, anyone else from the board? Have any thoughts regarding um, whether or not you'd like to see this tested um, or made a policy, one versus the other, or at the same time, one before the other? Is this something that this board is comfortable in um, moving this to the policy board for further discussion? Since there's nothing really in in the plans right now to to use this pol this this draft policy on with Taltog. Bill Hyatt. Yeah, just building on, on what Jay said before in terms of the preferred way to to, uh, to develop and apply this, uh, you know, I, I agree with John that I think building it out for a couple of additional species for which we anticipate uh, needing to take management action would be a, would be a good step. So I, I I think instead of thinking about it as a test, at least based upon what Jay said earlier, I would think about it more as a build out for a couple of species that we would anticipate using it on. And and Jay, please jump in if I'm misinterpreting anything that, that you said. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, that's a good way to look at it. it it's clear in my mind. Um, Jay, I'll ask you, is that along the lines of how you were thinking this might work well for the for the commission? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I think okay. I'm spot on to kind of keep it rolling, give it a couple more um, cases to give people that context, and then um, you know, kind of it, it, that's how it, it would implement anyways is kind of in this stepwise process. So it's not like you would have to redo the ones that you've done already if if you like the way they came out. So yeah. I think it can work well that way. Okay. Um, if that is the pleasure of the board, Tony, can I ask you if would there need to be a motion no, to I provide think, yeah. that direction? I think we have that on the record here, staff have that recording and we can um, bring that into the policy board discussion. Okay. Bill, did you have a follow up to that? I see your hand again. Nope, just forgot to put my hand down. That's okay. Um, okay, so before staff takes this discussion and runs with it, let me ask, is there any objection to what we have heard about kind of, um, expanding this to some other species through discussion with the policy board um, for species that we may be considering uh, management change in the near future so that it can be tested uh, prior to uh, its 
being approved as a policy for the commission. Is there any objection to that to that idea, which was floated? And Tony just indicated that staff would be able to um, put package that together and prepare it for the policy board discussion at a, at a later date. Okay, I don't see any objection at this time, so um, that'll be the plan, and uh, we will uh, we'll have that discussion next at policy board. But Jason, thank you very much for your presentation and the work that you've done here, and uh, perhaps we'll we'll be using it down the road uh, the next time that we uh, need to make some management changes on this species. So thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, that takes us uh, to. Our last item on the agenda, other than other business, which is a review of the feedback from the Law Enforcement Committee on the Commercial Tagging Program. Uh, Jason Snowbaker is with us. Um, Jason is, he represents the Law Enforcement Committee uh, for this board, and I'm gonna turn over to Jason. Jason, did you have a presentation you wanted to offer, or are you just gonna speak? Uh, yes, I believe uh, somebody there was gonna throw the slides up for me. Okay, great. Whenever you're ready, Jason, you go ahead and uh, get you can get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Good afternoon, board and Mr. Chair. Um, in August, the board was presented initial reports from the TC industry and the law enforcement committee on the implementation of the tagging program. Focus was general and was to assess compliance and reducing illegal harvest. Um, the assessment of compliance and reducing illegal harvest has not been done in depth. In October. The board considered questions for the law enforcement law enforcement committee to answer to help assess. Number one, the compliance with the tagging program and the impact of the program in reducing illegal harvest uh, and markets. Next slide. Uh, today we're gonna to go over a summary of the law enforcement committee feedback on each of the board questions. Next slide. First question, are there any areas of concern, example specific fisheries or markets where compliance with TALTOG tagging requirements remains a significant issue? Please be as specific as possible. Law enforcement committee feedback on the next slide, please. A few commercial harvesters um, in possession of fish above the trip limit upon returning to the dock or penning fish up at sea. Um, the fishermen cited the need to avoid multiple trips in bad weather. Sometimes this occurred um, prior to the season opening. Generally, uh, good compliance in the commercial fishery, primarily concern uh, was observed um, in the rec by the recreational sector. Um, harvest above the trip limits, co coordinating among bad actors makes monitoring difficult in the recreational sector and the commercial sector. Law enforcement committee was challenged by limited staff and competing priorities in monitoring the illegal harvest of Taltogs. Next slide, question two. Is there a practical way for agencies to collect information on non-compliance with tagging requirements in the fishery or markets that could inform and improve the efficiency, efficiently and effectiveness of law enforcement efforts? Examples might include specific types of advanced information gathered by agency biologists or by partner organizations. Please be as specific as possible. Next slide was the feedback from the Law Enforcement Committee. Using other agencies or organizations to monitor markets is challenging. There's a distrust of outsiders from the community. Inspections need to be synced or conducted simultaneously, otherwise illegal sales move uh, elsewhere. Again, most commercial harvesters and markets appear compliant. It's unclear if collecting non-compliance information would help more. The best approach um, is for the law enforcement committee to meet regularly and exchange updates and information. The primary of concern is the recreational fishery, but increasing monitoring is challenged by limited staff. Question three on the next slide. Any additional thoughts or recommendations for improving the efficiency and effectiveness of enforcement of the tagging program? Next slide. Law enforcement committee feedback. Uh, a few law enforcement committee members have heard 
of frustration from commercial harvesters about the tag type, specifically citing the tags causing sores or infections and hurting sales. Law Enforcement Committee felt the best way to strengthen compliance with the tagging program is to have full buy-in from the commercial sector um, and possibly continue to test and evaluate tag types may help improve compliance. Next slide, question four. Now that the tagging program has been underway for a couple of years, what is your expectation on if the program will ultimately be successful at reducing illegal fishing and markets? Next slide. The Law Enforcement Committee, um, overall, the Law Enforcement Committee is in agreement that the tagging program has reduced the illegal harvest. The big change is that the illegal harvest seems to primarily be in the recreational fishery. When harvest is above the possession limit, it's difficult to determine if the extra fish are intended for private consumption or illegal sales. That concludes the Law Enforcement Committee summary. Is there any additional questions this time? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Let me see if anybody has any questions for Jason at this time. Um, and I, as I mentioned before we began the meeting, uh, during the public comment, there will be an opportunity for the public um, to offer some thoughts here as well. Dan McKiernan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the question I have, I think, has to do with uh, question number one. The, there was uh, some comments about multiple trips being made in bad weather. Could we go back to that slide? Yeah, so my, actually, if you go forward one slide, um, I guess one of my questions is on that first bullet, um, where it was found that some folks were making multiple trips in, to avoid bad weather, were those in a quota managed state? So, you know, not the challenge we have here is some of our states, like us in the state of Rhode Island, have a finite quota. and you know, if somebody made multiple trips to avoid uh, bad weather, it's probably less of a problem than if the, the the incident where this state took place was not a quota managed state. Yes. Yeah, so, any... go ahead. From what I understand, it would be where there was a trip limit. So, if maybe if there was a two hundred pound trip limit, what was happening is, is the vessel would go out to sea, maybe catch four or six hundred pounds. Um, not fish for three days, but have the trip limit penned up or be able to go out to sea um, inshore, near shore, close to the dock, or even at the dock, be able to take, you know, 200 pounds out of that pen and, and sell it, um, you know, versus trying to um, go out in the weather, in bad weather and, and get 200 pounds every day, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, it does. All I'm pointing out is if it's a quota managed state, it's less of a problem because the overall removals would be capped. But if it's not a quota managed state, then it, it would could result in excessive harvest. Thanks for that. Okay, thanks, Dan. Thanks, uh, Jason. Any other questions? On this uh, law enforcement committee report, any questions? Any comments? Okay, why don't we take an opportunity um, to give some thought to, as for board members to give some thought to any comments they wanna make. And I'll go ahead and offer an opportunity for the public. At this time, uh, earlier, we had Tim O'Brien. Tim, are you still with us? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Okay, we can hear you. So if you want to offer your comments now, I think it's more fitting than uh, when you had put your hand up earlier. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for the information. Um, but yeah, basically the problem that we're seeing is uh, these tags harming the fish. 
um, the live fish and effectively they get infections and it's affecting the market value. Um, I think there's, you know, a, a different tagging system would uh, maybe avoid this from happening. You got me? Hello? Mike, if you're talking to us, you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. I appreciate yeah, no, no, you're fine, Tim. Thanks for your comment. Did you have any thoughts as to what that tagging system could look like? Or are you, in, I guess you'd be in favor of the, of the commission working to uh, evaluate other types of tags? Is that where you're getting? At? Yes, um, you know, I guess the challenge is putting a tag through, say, the meat or the fillet of the fish would damage the fillet. Um, the gill is obviously damaging the fish. Um, maybe something that goes through a fin um, I'm not familiar with all the tags, but I have seen them in horseshoe crabs. Um, it's a thin, um, plastic tube almost like, almost like a zip tie. Um, but yeah, there is a challenge with not harming the fish and not ruining the product. So okay. yeah, it would have to just be, yeah, tested. Got you. Thank you for your comment. I appreciate it. Anyone Thank else? From the, anyone else from the public? Before I come back to uh, members of the board. Okay, I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I have another hand. Anthony uh, Sedan Sedano Sedano. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? There you go. Yep. Hey, what's up? How are you guys doing? All right. Good. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, I was just going to comment on Tim's remark. Uh, same thing uh, is happening uh, with, with my fish, taking them, you know, inserting the applicator into the gill. Sometimes to flip the fish jump, you know, it seems to cause them pain. I mean, uh, I mean it's obvious that it causes them pain. And sometimes the gills get damaged. And, uh, you know, like Tim said, there goes your life. You know, there goes either a fish or, uh, you know, all people don't want to buy them. Uh, and, and also, uh, infections, you know, sometimes if you're holding a fish, uh, if I'm holding fish in, in pens to get to my daily limit, you know, if it takes two days or whatever, seeing the same thing, you know, it doesn't take long. Uh, so just, 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 just to reiterate what Tim said, I agree with that. And uh, I think a different tagging, uh, I mean, the tagging system I, I is obviously, I guess, good for, you know, uh, illegal fish and all that, which obviously helps the, uh, the species, but, I think a different way of tagging would definitely work better. That's all really that happens there. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your comment. Um, the last one last time. I didn't see any new hands come up from any members of the public. Okay, seeing no additional hands, I'll come back to the board. Uh, Dan McKiernan, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess it would be useful for us to hear from some of the dealers because when I read the, the reports uh, that were uh, part of the materials for this meeting, I read about uh, you know fish that were being held for up to three months, which I was really surprised that anybody would hold a fish for more than three months uh, or that long. And so it seems to me that, that if the tag is being used properly and it seems like uh, you know, we're not getting many complaints from, from uh, from all states, but it seems to be a core group of fishermen that are challenged by that. Um, it seems like we should be um, talking to the dealers about whether this is actually affecting X vessel price because these fish are are destined to die <laughs> anyway. Um, if it reduces the shelf life, I'd be interested to know if it's actually affecting our market value because um, we're not hearing from dealers. I can tell you that I had a really interesting case uh, where a dealer in Massachusetts shipped a fish to New York and that fish was short and that uh, dealer called me uh, to tell me exactly who caught that fish. <laughs> and it was caught by an out of state uh, uh, environmental police officer, uh, not the state where it was landed. I, I think that's brilliant. That's exactly what we were trying to accomplish. And um, I will con uh, concede that 
the tag that we that was originally tested by the uh, State University of New York was a smaller version of the tag that we went with in the end, and we went with the larger fish, uh, the larger tag in the end because we needed to put more information on the tag. Uh, the the smaller tag that was in the in the uh, in the trials, uh, in the end, uh, wasn't large enough to inscribe all the necessary information. So um, I'm personally a little skeptical that we we need to change the the tagging system, um, but I'm certainly open-minded. But I would like to hear from dealers uh, as to whether or not this is a market issue or not. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Dan. Um, I would as well. I'd, uh, maybe I'll ask Tony what. The process would be um, working with staff to get some type of report, maybe at our next meeting, regarding the situation and with uh, some dealer information, some dealer input. Tony, is there uh, something that we could do here as a board to uh, to to task task yep. staff with that? Thanks, Mike. I think we can definitely task staff to to work on that. What I would want. And I don't necessarily think we have to work this out today, but I would want to know specifically what questions you would like us to ask the dealers. And then we may need some help from the states on dealers to reach out to. Um, it's not someone that we interact, the FMP coordinators interact with on the regular. So we would, in order to get quick responses back for you guys we would need a little help there okay um do you think that's something that we could put down as an item for an upcoming agenda to see if yep. we could generate you know maybe staff can can work up um some ideas to build from and we can go from there yes we can do that and i'm uh I will say that it would either be at the um, spring or summer meeting that we would bring that back to you all. As you know, um, Kirby, who's the coordinator for this species, is um, leaving us at the end of the month for a new job. And so we'll just have a new staff member on this and they'll take a little while to get up to speed. And I want to make sure to set that expectation. Yeah, no, of course. And um, it does take time and it, you know, that's in my mind, that's fine. Uh, it doesn't seem as if this I, this issue is, into, you know, so pressing that we need answers immediately. So, um, before I ask the board if they support that concept moving forward, let me. I've got a few other hands uh, to go to. I'm going to start with Eric Reed, and then I'll Bill Hyatt. I'll come back to you. Go, ahead. Eric. You're up first. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You hear me? Okay. Yep. Perfect. So, as far as the market value goes for live to tag. I mean, there it's an ornamental dinner, you know, to celebrate. It's a pretty exotic dinner, and those fish are served whole. As far as I know, they're served whole. It's a big presentation thing, and you know, the market value for something that's got a big blemish or bruise or some other thing on its face absolutely does lose value in my mind. That's the problem. You know, nobody's buying a live photographer to cut it into fillets and then you know throw the rack away. They're using it as a uh, you know, special occasion. You you probably had one on your birthday, Mike. You know, but that that's uh, it does affect the market value when the the fish itself isn't perfect. So that, that's my opinion. Thank you. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, my birthday's in two weeks, so I'll I'll be expecting uh, a package in the mail. I guess. Uh, yeah, you'll get a package, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I will. <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought I had Bill next. Did Bill, did you put your hand down accidentally or did you um, want to make the same point? Uh, no, no, I did, I did have a question. I did put my hand down, um, but I'll, I'll ask it. Just uh, for clarification with uh, on Jason's law enforcement uh, report, um, I, I looked at the material, the meeting materials again, and it, it mentioned relative to the what was being observed in the recreational fishery that um, boats are being uh observed operating in unison um it says later on that it's hard to prove that the fish the over harvest from the recreational fishery is being directed towards the market um i guess my question to to jason is 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 that kind of what the, they suspect 
is, is, is do they suspect that the real the remaining issue relative to illegal harvest is largely for the market is largely being driven by illegal recreational harvest so if if i gave you a scenario where you know three or four guys were out in a boat and they came back with you know 50 60 70 extra tal tog when you're standing on the dock you, and you don't know these these folks you have no idea whether they're they're just out there for a good day of fishing um they had a good day and they they're they're they they weigh the risk and reward or you know once they go home and and you know at the end of the day are they are they going to take them somewhere to a local establishment where they live which is often in another state you know we don't know what their intention was and they're you know when you're you know, conducting an inspection and you're conducting business and issuing summonses, they're not going to come out and tell you that. So that's kind of what that was meant. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I mean, anytime we see a large number of fish, we try and assess, you know, based on the gear, um, you know, any kind of conversation we have on, on, you know, how knowledgeable they are, you know, just small talk sometimes where it, it indicates to us that these guys know what they're doing. Um, they've done this before, um, but, you know, a lot of times you just don't know. Are, are they keeping these fish alive? Are they coming ashore alive or are you seeing the are these fish coming ashore already dead? I've personally seen it, seen it both ways. I've seen um, people who had tanks and, you know, in conversation, they had a, a, a swimming pool or a tank in their basement and, they kept fish alive in their in their house for personal consumption and their and their their family. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank thank you for that. Um, next on my list, I have Jesse Hornstein. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to make the board aware that uh, New York is going to be sending out a survey to our permit holders and dealers as well. Uh, to get uh, get additional feedback on how the program went this year, um, so we'd be you know happy to to share the uh, the survey that was put together with staff to you know work towards getting additional information from other states as well. All right, I appreciate that that information, uh, Jesse. Dan McKiernan. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just if if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you'd allow me one more comment here. I want us to be real careful about conclusions and uh, anecdotal conclusions about the saleability of a single fish in a pan. Um, I had a fisherman comment to me, uh, an out-of-state fisherman, who felt that his fish were worth more because a lot of the illegal fish on the market, because of the tagging program, disappeared. And so his fish uh, brought a higher ex-vessel price because some of the dealers couldn't get the 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 unlawful fish. Now, I'm not saying the dealers knew the fish were unlawful, but, you know, once fish leave, you know, Massachusetts in the old days before the tagging program, who would know? And so I think this overall program probably increased price per pound uh, to the legally caught to tog. And I just want us to keep a, an eye on that. Um, as I understand it, New York just finished their first year with the tagging program. Uh, it was easier for us in the second year. So maybe through some uh, more uh, practice with the uh, with the tag and the applicator. Uh, maybe things get better in the second year. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Anyone else from the board I'd like to make a comment on this? Jason McNamee. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, just a quick comment. Uh, you know, to echo something that uh, Dan McKiernan said earlier. Um, you know, I'll keep an open mind on this as well. If there's a better solution out there, um, I'm interested to, to learn about that better solution. But, um, you know, I would need it to be based on as careful testing as we did, you know, in the first round. And, um, you know, that would be compelling to me if there's something as effective that gets tested um, with the same amount of um, you know, care that we took when picking uh, the current tags, you know, 
modifications to that notwithstanding. Um, so I just wanted to sort of offer um, offer that comment um, to to the board as well. I, you know, I'm sort of like Dan McKiernan just said a moment ago. Our fishermen didn't love the idea. Kind of work through it. I think it's going um, okay in Rhode Island, and and like he said, it took um, it took some getting used to. So that's the reason why I just don't want to haphazardly switch um, after making that effort and, and implementing it in our state. But if there's a better solution that can have um, as good or better outcomes that um, people are interested in, I, I am open-minded about taking a look at that and. And um, you know, seeing the, the data that comes out of that that um, study. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, I think your point's well covered here. Uh, as far as jumping the gun, uh, this make, to making changes, I don't necessarily think that's where we are, but I think it would be helpful, uh, as recommended by I think it was um, Dan, to you know, put some information together to seek to try to solicit some information back from the dealer side uh, of this fishery. So, you know, I'll take that as a task, uh, unless there's objection by the board. Um, we've already discussed it, and it sounds as if Tony's on. Tony's and staff are aware of that of that tasking. Once we have a new staff person to replace uh, Kirby after his departure, so. We'll have to look forward to that in, at a coming at a meeting uh, either the spring or summer, uh, more likely probably in the summer. So, is there anything else on this topic uh, regarding commercial tagging uh, to come before the board at this time? Okay, I see no hands at this time. Oh, I'm sorry, Roy Miller. Go ahead, Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just looking at the pictures that were included in our supplemental materials, um, some of the tagging wounds from the long-term holding uh, of Tautog for up to three months look pretty nasty. Uh, having not been involved in the original testing process for tags, is there any more work that should be done to, to try to avoid um, pictures like we saw, or is a three-month holding time way beyond what anyone thought would happen with these animals before they were uh, consumed? So the question is basically, is there more work we should do with regard to tag type, or is this the best we can accommodate? Thank you. That's a good question, Roy. Uh, I was not part of that initial um, experiment to determine the best tag type. So I'd have to look to staff or members of the board who played a role in that to help me with this one. Does anyone have any thoughts, anybody involved in that? Hey, Mike, it's, it's Kirby. I'll, I'll hey, just Kirby. note that, um, you know, as Dan, uh, McKiernan mentioned before, you know, one of the challenges has been trying to make sure we have all the information on the tag um, to, to, you know, uniquely identify that fish to the state and year. So, you know, I, I think something that the board, if they, if they truly wanted to consider an alternative tag, you know, there could be other ways to come up with, you know, a unique ID um, if there's interest in using the, you know, a smaller version of, of the current one, um, that would be maybe one approach if there's interest in that. Uh, but otherwise, I think, you know, it's important to try to, re you know, refer back to the, that study that New York and Massachusetts um, took part in to, to, to evaluate the tag types, because a number of them were looked at. The law enforcement committee had provided guidance on what their concerns were, especially around tamperability. So, you know, it's a, there was some considerable thought given to the strap tag that, that is currently being used. Okay, thanks. I uh, appreciate that, Kirby. Uh, John Maniscalco?
John, we can't hear you. Do you want to retry? You are unmuted. Try again. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, so thank you and not speaking as a, as a commissioner, but just as someone to provide some additional information on the um, You know, initial tagging study. Uh, we held those fish for approximately a month. Um, uh, certainly under different conditions than um, than some of our fishermen are are working under. But we did not see the uh, we did not see the infections. We did not see the mortality rates. Um, but if uh, interest is uh evident in our survey responses that we'll be sending out new york state's more than likely to more than happy to help with you know investigating alternative tech guys okay appreciate that john yeah i think the board could learn something from the survey and perhaps um, provide some direction uh, moving forward uh, after receiving that information roy miller Sorry, Mr. Chair, just lowering my hand. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think we have what we need at this time. It sounds as if New York's going to be doing the survey and we're going to work to um, put something together for a future meeting uh, regarding some questions and specifics that we want to direct towards, um, towards the dealers in this situation. To see what kind of information they can have for us. Is there anything else um, at this time on this topic from the board? Okay, seeing no hands at this time, uh, that takes us to our last item on today's agenda, which is other business. Is there any other business to come before the board at this time? Chris? I'd just like to thank Kirby for all of his great work and congratulations on the new job. Yeah, thanks, Chris. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to thank Kirby for all his work and efforts, not only on this board, uh, but on all the other species that, that he's been working on uh, throughout. The, I think it was nine years I read uh, that Kirby's been with the commission. So congratulations, Kirby, and uh, best of luck uh, on your new position. Okay, that concludes our business today. Um, and I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Chris's hand still up, so I'm going to say Chris Wright, seconded by Dave Sikorsky. We are any objection to the motion? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much.